Hey, good, good afternoon, I guess. It still feels early for me. We're going to go ahead and get started. Uh, welcome to this session. I hope everyone's enjoying AWS reInvent 2019. I'm continually amazed by the uh, scope and size of this event, and I really appreciate each of you taking the time to join us. So let's jump into it. My name's Rick Manover, uh, Senior Director of Product Strategy here at Veeam. And uh, on my team, we lead, basically, we're evangelists, tech evangelists and stuff. We are on the product team. We sit in between the field and, and product management and product marketing and customers, partners like you. And we're happy to bring this content to you. Yeah. I'm David Hill. I work for Rick. I'm a global technologist in the product strategy team. And as Rick said, we're all kind of evangelist, hands-on, kind of techie people, even though I do wear a suit jacket and get vilified for it. Well, actually, you say hands-on because my, my videos are a demo, so now I feel bad. And yours are live, so we've got some demos here for you. This is a great week because we have a new Veeam product. Hopefully, everybody caught the news. It was live in the Marketplace Monday. David's going to cover that at length. But these are the four things we're going to talk about, and the fourth one's a bonus. I really want to spend a lot of time on the third one. We're going to talk about how you can consume S3 for backup storage with Veeam. We're going to talk about beating ransomware. It's a topic of the day forever can never have too much resiliency against ransomware. I am going to do a brief intro of Veeam. Before we get into the details, um, there's one word. Remember backup. But by the numbers, we have thousands, hundreds of thousands of customers carry a plus 75 net promoter score. And by IDC data, we're number one market share in EMEA, number four worldwide for the backup market. Our backup products have been in the market since 2008. The company's founded in 2006. So that's intro of Veeam. But why do we do it? We want to implement some characteristics that matter. And on the product team, these are guiding principles that go throughout the whole company. But we want our products to be simple, reliable, and flexible. And I realize that each of you is IT pros, um, partners of Veeam. Everybody wants these characteristics. And I, from the inside of the product team, I can tell you these are mandates on how they're supposed to work. All right, so that's the intro to Veeam. The, luckily, I kept it under two minutes of marketing talk. So let's talk about Amazon S3 in the cloud tier. So Amazon S3, as you know, leading object storage engine. It's a great opportunity to leverage it for backup data. Now, David's going to talk about an additional way to do that here in a second. But I want to talk about something that, especially if you have workloads on premises or workloads in other clouds, you can leverage S3 to hold those backup data profiles. But in order to explain this cloud tier, I actually have to work backwards a bit and introduce something that I'm calling the scale-out backup repository. Now, this is a technology Veeam's had since our version 7. But the general guiding principle here is that it's an aggregation of storage devices of any type, traditional on-prem storage, NAS, direct attached storage, dedupe appliances, et cetera. And that collectively is one logical construct that we call the performance tier. Now, I live in a world of backups, and this is awesome, because I can put policies in here. Incremental backups go on the NAS device. Full backups go on the dedupe appliance. Very good characteristics. But the thought here, I like to say, getting storage, getting more storage is not a problem. Getting the money for storage is a problem, right? Couple that with our explosive amounts of growth, you fall into a situation where the only practical solution you have to have that long-term retention with explosive data profiles is the cloud. And AWS S3 storage is an outstanding choice for that. So the technology that's out there right now today is what we call move mode. So it's a policy-based engine that will transparently take older backups to the cloud. Very simple. And I'm going to dive into that here in a minute as we go on. So I call it move mode, and I need to kind of dissect something for you. The VBK file is Veeam's backup file. It's an image-based backup format that we've had since our version 1. Now, don't let the slices fool you. The blue is the metadata. The green is the data. But that's not necessarily commensurate to their size. The metadata is very efficient. But what we're doing now is we're actually condensing on-premises only the metadata and then putting the bulk of the data, as well as the metadata, into S3. This is a very efficient, transparent way that you can effectively be infinite in your backup storage in the cloud. Now, another practical way to interpret that is you can actually have very little storage on premises and everything else in the cloud. Short example here, if I need to keep a year's worth of backups, 
I'll keep seven days on-prem, two days on-prem, 358 in the cloud, 363 in the cloud, something like that. Pretty good math, actually. But to kind of visualize this a different way, what happens, and this is per file, but I want to come back to it across multiple files. So I talk about this shelling out of the file. So what happens is the metadata first goes into S3, and then secondarily, what is an object or what is a block on premises becomes an object in S3. So the data chunks get moved to S3. And on premises, they might be 512K, 1 meg, 256K, but they're completely disassembled and reassembled correctly for S3. And it's very important because the metadata tracks it in both places. The end result is you have a storage efficiency. I don't want to call it deduplication, but I'll say that it prevents duplication. Okay, you with me? But it is a storage efficiency. So the benefit there is that while you have the storage efficiency, you can comfortably retain longer with S3. It's rather awesome if you ask me. That metadata is condensed, maybe 25 megabytes. If that was a terabyte backup file, you're left with 25 megs on-prem, and the depth of it goes to S3. So that's copy mode, or that's move mode but we're doing more with it. Now, what I just explained is available today, and I was hoping it would be available now, but we're implementing a new technique that we're gonna call copy mode, which is a little bit more aggressive in the consumption of AWS S3 storage, but there's good reason for it, and I'll come back to that. So what we're gonna implement in our next release is what we're calling copy mode. So instead of waiting till after seven days to move that data to the cloud, we're gonna go ahead and do it immediately, and I have a demo to show you that. But the magic here is that we have this thing we call the 3 two, one rule, having three different copies of your data, two different types of media, one of those being off-site. This can actually let S3 allow you to adhere to that. So it's a very resilient way to get that data off-site. And that way you don't have to consume additional other storage resources. There's also an immutability element, which I'll go to specifically here. This is actually a technology, at least the way Veeam's implemented it, specifically only available in S3. So this will help you beat ransomware, malicious admin, insider threat, accidental deletion, things like that. And the last cool thing about the copy mode is that just like the move mode that I explained earlier, it's streamlined. And everything Veeam does is hardware agnostic, cloud agnostic, software defined. We're software only. We don't make any storage. We partner with Amazon. We partner with Microsoft, VMware. Cisco and all the storage arrays, NetApp, et cetera, HPE. So we have this really interesting story about being portable, agnostic, et cetera. So anyways, when you combine copy and move, you're walking into a cloud-ready way to manage this data. And what I mean by that is you can have a copy for the first seven days of the backups in S3. And then after seven days, in that example, if they get older, we'll move them out. So this is a beautiful orchestration of the data, completely software defined, very easy to set up. And I think that the recent backups, when they're immediately copied to S3, along with the older backups moved to S3, it really puts your, your data protection and storage strategy central around S3. And if that's where you align at this event, probably aligns to what you're trying to do. Cools, so that copy mode has the same process as move mode, after a backup's done, it immediately will disassemble that backup file and create it into S3. Now, the one thing that's really important to note is that all of the capabilities within Veeam are completely transparent. You will have it in your console in Veeam Availability Suite. It'll tell you that it's in S3, but to you, it's a restore point, and you have that capability to restore it regardless of where it is. And there's also some intelligence that will say, oh, I have this data here that's closer, so I won't necessarily introduce unnecessary egress. So we're very API smart if there is such a thing. Now, the other thing to note is I mentioned that storage efficiency, it's not deduplication, but it prevents duplication. We've done that with a couple other technologies, and we, we've gravitated on the term spaceless full backups or something like that. But having a storage efficiency on this engine is very awesome as well. Now, the also important thing to note is that shared data blocks between copy and move comes back to that metadata. 
when we disassemble the backup files, look at the metadata, this really helps us be efficient on how we move data to S3. When we look in the user interface, the good news is, is that it's very transparent. This is a snippet of the new capability where copy all backups to object storage as they are created is selected. So the moment a backup's made, let's throw it up to S3. Now, why would you want to use the copy mode? I mentioned the 3, 2, 1 rule, but it also goes hand in hand as a really good use case of something that S3 provides. Is anybody familiar with S3 object lock? And the, yeah, it's a couple heads nodded, a couple hands. This is a really good technology around immutability. And immutability, you know, and just in terms of the word, just means Veeam can't delete it. You can't delete it as you try to access or consume your storage. You can write it in, but when object lock is enabled, you have some parameters that go with it. So in the Veeam situation, we will actually write it with a rule that says it has to stay in there for seven days or something like that. You can configure that number. And the magic here is that it'll apply to both copy and move. And we're going to have a lot of emerging kind of best practices around this. This particular technique, I'd like to say it's going to be available by the end of the year, but if not, it'll be the first part of next. But within 45 days is a safe number. So let's take a look at the first of the quick demos that I, I want to show for you. So what we're looking at here, this is our version 10. This is the release. We're currently in beta 2. The next milestone is a release candidate. But when I do, first thing I'm going to do is run a backup job. So I went ahead and hit start. Now, the move mode, uh, in addition to the copy mode, is transparent to me. So let's take a look at this S3 bucket that I've got here. So I mentioned the scale-out backup repository aggregates multiple storage systems. There they are. One of them is S3. So here's the scale-out backup repository that is, I like to say, backed by S3. So it's made infinite by S3 storage. And I'm going to go ahead and hit properties of it. If you've not used this technology, again, I encourage you to check it out. I'll skip over the performance tier, but it has a very granular control for you. Uh, right here is where that is, data locality and performance. But then right here, I want to go over and say, let's extend it to S3. So right there, I've selected that S3 is going to be where this logical construct, the scale-out backup repository, gets extended to the cloud. Now, right here, I still have that move capability. That's what we have in place right now today. And of course, you always want to encrypt when you send that data to the cloud. But in the middle there, which Oh, I'm switching my colors. Yep, let's go to red. Is the copy backups to object storage as soon as they are created. The copy mode is implemented just with a simple click right here. This is a single step of the wizard, but it's a very busy spot. And this particular element here will, will allow us to quickly get that data into S3 as soon as the backups are done. So I've just shown you what was already configured. And that was just a brief you know, walk through of the wizard. But you might remember that the first thing I did was start the backup job. And if I go over here and look, it's, it's about halfway done. So two of those virtual machines have been backed up, but you'll see that I have two jobs running. One of them is the backup job. So those four VMs in that example were running. But if I look a little closer, I'll also see sober tiering, scale out backup repository tiering happening at the same time. And if I look here, I can zoom in. Well, it, you got to be quick. Uh, it's actually a very efficient engine, so it actually finished up on me. So I'll look at the successful finish here. There you can see the policy. Uh, that means something to me. The O2 cluster, tier one, 12 hour backup policy going to S3. Just like that. After that backup was done, that was an incremental. It immediately sent that data over to the cloud. Now, that's part of it, but there's always more. So that's where I want to go show you that it's completely transparent in the user interface, right? So these restore points with copy mode and move mode exist on premises. They're in my console. I can do anything I want with them. The one at the top is red only because the job isn't done yet. But then in object storage, I can see that consistent inventory of what's backed up. You'll see that those three are there with a multiple set of restore points. Completely transparent as well. But I mentioned it, like I said, there's more. And that's where the immutability element comes into play. So I mentioned object lock. I mentioned copy mode. 
but you have to kind of put two of these together because I guess if you're comfortable, the camera can't see, but has anybody had a ransomware situation in their environment? A couple hands, I know there's more. I can tell you Veeam support happens every day. We've actually had to reconfigure how our support works. And I tell you that because it, it's important to note that it's not just a PC problem. This is absolutely a data center problem. It can be an in-the-cloud problem. And we don't want to see people have these problems. So we've actually made other enhancements in regards to being resilient against ransomware. But when it comes to being resilient against ransomware with the cloud, we have an opportunity to do something really amazing. I like to call it a, a near air gap. So if you think about copy mode, take a backup. It immediately goes to S3. And if I'm putting in that object block, I'm making up an example, seven days, that means those first seven days, I cannot delete them. I cannot right click in Veeam and say delete. I cannot go into the bucket and say delete. It's very resilient against insider threat, ransomware, things like that. So if you combine those two angles, copy mode, object lock, you can actually have some really powerful ransomware resiliency powered by AWS. Now the magic here is that we've integrated with this capability, but you do have to use them together. And if you think about when you have a ransomware situation, chances are you're gonna to wanna to restore from the most recent restore point, the most recent backup you've taken. So let me show you how that works. So here in S3, make sure it starts, yep. I have a bucket at the bottom, and I, I don't know if I'll use my good zoom it skills here, but this particular uh, bucket is the immutable testing bucket. Piece of practical advice, if you're gonna use object lock or the immutability, make it very self-describing in the name all throughout the use of Veeam and the cloud, because then you'll get into situations where I can't delete it or something like that. So I'm gonna make a new bucket and call it immutable backups. So there's a name right away, making it very visible. I'm gonna drop in my AWS credentials. All of the region types are supported. And then I'm gonna go find that bucket. So I had that bucket called immutable testing. I only have S3 in my account in US East Ohio, which is where I'm from. And I've got that bucket I just identified there. And again, I also recommend that you over document, over self describe have that, especially when immutability comes in, because you might have some surprises in your cost profile if you can't delete the data. So that also goes back to where you put the data, and I'll get to that in a second. So here we go. I've made a folder inside of that bucket called Immutable Backups for Veeam V10. That means something to me. The application is Veeam, the version is 10. What is it? It's Immutable Backups. And right here are three, sorry, two really important safeguards. Limit object storage consumption and make backups immutable. So let's zoom into this real quick. Maybe, maybe I'll zoom into it. The limit object storage is actually a really nice safeguard. And what I mean by a safeguard is it's a soft safeguard. If we fill it up to 10 terabytes in this example, it'll let the next job finish, but it won't run tomorrow to put 10 more terabytes in. Nice little safeguard. And then this option here, make backups immutable for seven days in that example, addresses those threats. Combining that with move mode, you have the technology here powered by AWS S3 that Veeam's integrated with that's been leveraged here to give you these great opportunities. So now all I have to do is just add a new backup repository. And again, a backup repository, the scale out backup repository type, that is where Veeam puts its backups. Again, I'm using my immutable in the name. So I have this additional construct here that's implementing the cloud tier with copy mode and move mode that will hold immutable backups. And let's add one other storage system. This is, you could use this on-prem, but you could also use this a couple of other different ways. But the thought here is that once I put these backups in S3, those first seven days from the configuration of the bucket will actually be immutable. So the only available bucket for me to choose is that immutable one, because I've already selected the other one. And then I hope I select the copy, book, uh, copy to object storage. Yep, so I did select that. And basically, this configuration here walks you into that really good resiliency technique. You're gonna put backups into a bucket with object lock on. Copy mode will immediately do it. 
and then eventually you'll move the old ones out. So based on this policy, 30 days they get moved out, seven days are immutable. And then from here, that's a target that I can do all kinds of stuff with. I can put backups there of my most critical systems. I could use the Veeam backup copy job to maybe put some policies around what should be immutable. It's a really great engine that you can do some rather amazing things with. And then here's the backup copy job where I actually indeed set that up. So again, self-documenting where I'm using immutable in the backup copy job. That was the example I was doing at cloud tier copy mode. And then I'll go ahead and finish out this. And this is not a new technology from Veeam, the backup copy job, but there it is, number two, immutable. And I can put some retention in there as well. Very granular, dare I call it software defined, policy driven, whatever you want to do, you can do it there. So that's a quick overview, minus the copy mode and object lock S3 capabilities. You can do those today. You can, you can send data to the cloud now. You can move to the cloud with our restore technique. But probably the big thing that we're all excited for is something that uh, went live in the marketplace Monday. And I'd like to turn it over to David to talk about that. Perfect. So Rick's actually going to run away now. Yeah, he... I got, I got a, a, another commitment I need to tend to. But David will carry on. And before I forget, definitely stop by the booth. We've got our engineers. Yeah. Um, that'll be there. And I'll be there later this afternoon as well. All right, cool. He'd rather go talk to other people than stay with me. Sometimes. Thanks, boss. <laughs> So yeah, as Rick mentioned, we announced a new product yesterday that's live in the marketplace, and it's called Veeam Backup for AWS. Now, when we say we announced and it's in the marketplace, what we've actually released is a free product. So as I'm going to talk through this, remember that what we're showing and what we're talking about at the moment is completely free. So if any of you want to try it out or any of you want to use it, please go ahead. But before I dive into that, um, Quick show of hands, how many people are existing Veeam customers in this room? Awesome, I might as well go home, we're done. <laughs> um, what I'm gonna show you now is purely for backing up AWS workloads and instances, but I'm also gonna show you how it integrates with Veeam's existing product, Veeam Backup and Replication. So for, for cloud native applications, this is what we need to provide enterprise grade backup solutions, but also for existing customers, this helps us actually deliver a seamless migration and protection platform for also on-premises and the public cloud. So Veeam Backup for AWS, as I mentioned, it's cloud native backup. So it fully automates Amazon EBS snapshots and we also leverage Amazon S3 to provide the actual backend backup repository. And I'll go into that in a little bit more. For those who have all used Veeam in the past, we bring the same capabilities that we have in Veeam backup and replication to Veeam backup for AWS with our granular file level restores. So for any Windows machines you've got running in EC2, then you can actually go in and recover individual files without having to recover whole instances into EC2. It's very cost effective. It's free for up to 10 instances. So there's no cost at all. Same as our community edition with Veeam Backup and Replication. Those 10 instances you can do, you get the full product, uh, all the features, all the capabilities for free included in that, in that, and that's on the marketplace today. We're bringing flexible license choices, so we'll do bring your own licenses. So for Veeam backup and replication customers, you can actually bring your licenses and protect your instances wherever they are, whether they're running on-prem, on vSphere, Hyper-V, Nutanix, physical, or running in EC2. And then we'll also bring like a paid for version through the marketplace, and that will actually launch next week. The other cool thing as well is the long-term data retention with S3. We can actually build policies around how we provide that data retention. So as Rick was talking earlier about the cloud tier and how you can leverage S3 to store your backups there, we can do the same with, with this product. Now, today, all it's protecting is EC2 instances. It's a version one product that we've just launched. 
in the next few months as we bring our release cycles to market, we're going to be protecting other things like RDS and stuff like that as well, like VPC backups. So it, it will grow throughout the year with, with features as well. But first of all, if we, if we look at how it works, essentially what we have is you go in the marketplace, you search for Veeam, really simple, say deploy, and it deploys this appliance into EC2 through, through an AMI. We protect all those EC2 instances through the Elastic Block Store. So any EBS volume we can protect out in Amazon. And then what we also recommend is actually having multiple accounts. So building out a backup account to put this appliance into, and then leveraging IAM roles to actually connect through to your production environment to protect those workloads. We also use these construct called workers. So what we do is we actually, as we're performing tasks, we dynamically spin up workers in whatever region or availability zone that we need to perform tasks in. Now, the reason why we do this is actually to help reduce costs. If you think about S3, for example, and you have a bucket in Oregon, and you want to take some backups of workloads running in London or North Virginia or Singapore, somewhere like that. If you create one bucket in Oregon, and then you're copying data from Singapore, Amazon charge you for that data that's going out of region. So there's a lot of network traffic coming out and going into S3. So what we recommend is you create regional buckets, and then we spin these workers up, which are basically just like very small instances that spin up dynamically for while we need to perform some tasks. And then we copy that data in region. So there's no actual data transfer costs because it never leaves the regions. Built into the product as well, which is quite cool, I'll show you in a minute, we have a cost estimator. So it actually shows you the policies that you build, what the costs are going to be and the impact. And then we can take snapshots, or we can take backups, or we can do both. And we can leverage different capabilities within EC2 to, to deliver that. When we want to do any restores, it's pretty simple. We can do a restore straight from an EBS snapshot. That's not exactly rocket science. How many people have been using snapshots in EC2? Yeah, nothing kind of brand new and mind-blowing about that. But what we do is we bring a bit of kind of policy goodness to this so we can manage those. How many times have people looked at their list of snapshots and gone, oh, my God, how, how do I manage these? You know, how long have they been there? Oh, then you look at the bill and you're like, oh, this just gets worse. So we bring the management capabilities to that. So we can actually define on policies how long they're kept for, how long you want to keep them for, whether you want to, after a certain period of time, offload those out to S3, things like that. Very similar to what you would expect and you see in Veeam Backup and Replication we've brought into this product. So an in-place restore is pretty simple. We just overwrite that particular instance that's running in that region. And great. You know, we've done that. But typically, you don't want to do overwrites. So we can do new restores as well. So we can restore to any region, any location in EC2. So even if you've took a backup of London in, of an instance running in London, and you want to go restore it to Oregon, you can do that. Obviously, we'll tell you how much it's going to cost from, from that perspective. And you can go restore wherever you want. So once we do that, it all just comes up. And what we're doing here is just taking these from snapshots. So we're just taking these snapshots and restoring them wherever. But also with S3, if you don't want to use snapshots, because when you start building up lots of snapshots, EBS storage can get quite expensive, especially if you've got terabytes and terabytes of data. You can actually just put your backups into S3 and then just restore directly from S3. And again, all we do is we spin up a worker node. We essentially just, again, as I mentioned, bring up an instance in that particular region, and then you just use some Amazon API calls to, to, to bring those EC2 instances along. Again, we can do in place, or we can bring it and just go and do a, a new instance in whatever region we want to. So it all just 
restores very, very easy. Pretty simple. We can do volume restores as well as instance restores. So you can actually restore volume onto EBS and then attach that directly to an existing instance if you want. But my favorite capability is around the file level restores, which I'll, I'll show you in a demonstration in a minute. And essentially, what we do there is we spin up a little worker, and we take this backup that's in S3, and we attach that to the worker. And then you can browse that through a web browser and search for the files. So say, just an example, you know, you've got some users on a file server, and they've gone and deleted the spreadsheet, it's your, your, your CFO, they would never do that, of course, and delete the spreadsheets. And you can go in, same way that you can with traditional file-based backups on premises, you can do that in, in Amazon as well. And the great thing about this is when we bring this all together, Rick spoke about the 3 two, one rule. Now, there's been some conversations with people in the past about, well, I don't need to worry about the 3 two, one rule because all my stuff is in the cloud. And my argument is, yes, it's in the cloud, and OK, S3 is pretty resilient, you know, EBS is pretty resilient. You can't guarantee that that particular region isn't going to have some kind of major outage, or you're going to have some data corruption, or as Rick mentioned, you're going to have ransomware attack your workloads. So when you're trying to build that 3 two, one rule, just from a public cloud perspective, it can become a bit of a challenge. So we can bring this all together with Veeam Backup and Replication for the on-prem solutions as well. So the Veeam Backup for AWS is deployed in EC2. We spin those workers up, and we offload our backups out to the cloud storage. So our S3, so the snapshots, and the Veeam backup repository. What's really cool about this as well is, once we've taken backups, we actually break these backups down into uh, what we call our OVBK. So Rick was talking about the Veeam backup file, the VBK that we use on-prem. We use a very similar format type in object storage where we break these down into data chunks so we can manage these accordingly. So whether we want to do incremental backups or full backups, we're only actually storing used data in S3. So if you've got a, a 30 gig VM and you're only using 10 gig of it, rather than taking that 30 gig and storing 30 gigabytes in S3, we're only going to take the used data chunks. So we'll only be storing 10 gigabytes. So we, we, we store this in the proprietary Veeam backup format. And then when we bring on-premises into play, with Veeam Backup and Replication, we have a feature called External Repository. Now, this allows you to connect to S3 buckets that are backup repositories for Veeam Backup for AWS and actually leverage those and manage those backups as if they were on-prem. You can then go and do restores to vSphere, Hyper-V, physical if you wanted to, um, of course, no other clouds exist in the world. So you, but if you, there was another cloud out there, you could possibly restore to another cloud. And from that perspective, bringing it all together helps us bring that best practice of that three to one rule, which is three copies of your data across two media types and one off-site. And it's always that off-site that's the challenge that, that we get when, when we're looking at this. So I'm going to do a quick demo. Um, hopefully, my stuff hasn't timed out while I talk. Uh, I had this happen a few times, and I'll switch. I do have to log in. Good old Windows. It loves me. Now, I'm a bit braver than Rick, and I like to do live demos. So, But what I'm going to show you is first, I'm going to show you Veeam Backup for AWS. So this is the, the web front end that you get for the product that's backing up all your instances. So the first thing you see when you log in is you see all the kind of reports on what's going on. And we have this kind of dashboard at the top that shows how many repositories we have, how many backup policies we have, how many instances were protected, and how many total instances. 
So if we look at this, what we'll see is we can see that I have a number of instances. We can see some here, like these ones, which are um, actually Amazon EKS workloads. But then we also have some other instances that I'm running. It sounds like Santa's coming. <laughs> Is Rudolph around? <laughs> And what we actually see here is I only have seven of those 11 instances protected. Now, the reason for that is um, I don't want to back up my Kubernetes workloads. For a start, they're pretty big, and I don't need to protect them because they're, they're just an environment that, that's destroyed. But when we create our policies, we can create policies for individual regions, individual instances, or we can create global policies. Now, what I've done here is actually created policies based on service levels. So I have some instances that are mission critical. Um, you'll see one that says smart DNS. My wife uses it to watch TV on, so that to me is mission critical, so I don't get a phone call. So that's in, in a particular policy. And we just break these down really simple into a number of areas. So first of all, you give it a name. We define what accounts we create as well. Now, I'm just using a default account, but we can actually pre-create IAM roles in multiple accounts and include these. So when you think back to what I was saying about the best practice of actually building this out and having a separate dedicated backup account, the reason why I like that idea is if somebody managed to, and we've seen it before, get in and somehow have access to the production environment where all the data is stored, by having a separate backup account with a separate S3 bucket in separate accounts, if somebody was malicious and they attacked all that production workload, your backup data is still protected with a security boundary of that AWS account. And if you remember AWS accounts, they're pretty much treated as individual security boundaries. And then you create IA, oh, I can never get it. I always got to say IIS, I'm that old. IAM roles to do your security across them. So it, it's a good kind of, if you think back to the old days where we used to talk about DMZs, it's a good kind of security boundary to provide that demilitarized zone. So we, we pick our accounts. We can pick our regions. So pretty much any region that we have with workloads running we, we can put in there. In this case, our, all my mission critical workloads run in Oregon. And then we can actually individually pick instances, or we can say all resources. So whenever an instance is created in that region, it will automatically get added to this policy if we pick all resources. And then we can actually just add instances, or we can do it on tags as well. So if you think about an automation perspective, anything that you're deploying through cloud formation scripts or anything of that kind of nature, you can define tags so they automatically get added to your backup policies as well. So I've just picked a few instances here. We can exclude resources. And then we come to the management of these, so snapshot management. So we can actually define how many restore points we want to keep from snapshots. And if you think about the, the actual speed of recovery, from a snapshot perspective, it's really quick. So if we keep some local snapshots, maybe four or five restore points, then we can speed up our recovery if we need it. And then once we get to a certain number, we will just automatically delete those snapshots. And then we also have the backup. So we pick up a backup repository, which we create in object storage in S3 how long we want to keep the backups for, so that particular retention period. And then we pick, pretty obvious, when we want the date and times we want to run. Then we go to our cost estimator. And I quite like this, because it shows you the total cost of what it's going to be over a particular month to, to actually do these backups, based on the traffic, the transaction costs, snapshot costs, that kind of thing. And then you can actually export these and, and run reports against them as well. Then finally, we have some settings if we want to, if we want to do like notifications and that kind of thing for our, for our essentially our day two ops. And, and that's pretty much it. That's how we build out a policy to protect our instances. Really straightforward. 
Now, once we have our policies and they're all defined and we can see that they all run at particular times, we then look at our protected data. And we can see that basically we, we see that we have the name of the policies that they're in, the actual instance names. So it is valuable to give your instances some names, otherwise they, they kind of do get a bit lost. And then we also have like our restore points. So we can see here that I have six restore points for these. Two of them are in our repositories. So I've got like a full backup here and then an incremental backup here. And then I'm also using snapshots. So it's interesting to note that the snapshot is eight gig in size, which is the total size of this instance. But the actual backups we're storing in S3 or a quarter of that, like 2.78 gig, and then an incremental of 121 gig. So we can see all our different snapshots. And then if we wanted to do a restore, we can do instance restore or volume restore. So we say, right, this instance, and we can add multiple instances, pick our restore points, pick again our, if I get it out, IAM roles. I'm just going to start saying management roles. It'd be easier. And then we can actually say, do we want to go to a new location? So this is where we can actually change configuration options as well. So we can go through, pick the region that we want to put it in. So we'll go down to Oregon. I'll pick the same region. Do we want to encrypt it as well? Do we want to keep the previous encryption scheme? And then do we want to change the instance size? So What's really good about this is if you're actually doing some restores and you realize that performance on this particular instance sucked, you can actually start increasing the instance sizes as well when you're doing the restores. And then we can pick all the different network settings. So we can actually change what VPC it's in, what subnets we want it on, and then our particular security groups as well. And then finally, all we do is, I'm not actually going to do the restore, but we give it a reason, and then we'll just do the summary. So really simple, really straightforward. But what I want to show you, which I actually think is really cool, is the file level restores. So I have a Windows machine here. Currently, we only support Windows. Linux will be coming fairly soon. And what I want to do is file level recovery. So I want to go into this actual Windows server and just pick one file out of it. So I'm going to say file level recovery, pick that VM. Yeah, VM. I've gone back to my VMware days. Instance. We can give it a reason, and then we just click Finish. And what we actually have now is if we go to our session logs, we'll see that we have this task running that's called file restore. And we'll go in here, and what we'll see is now we see that it says we're preparing the worker VM. So if we go over to here, and we look at our EC2 environment, we can see that I actually have the Windows instance running here. And what will happen is we'll spin up this worker node. Now, as I mentioned, we do this to help reduce the costs of in-traffic network. So we're not traversing lots of different regions. But also what this worker does is it actually connects to that S3 bucket and reads the object blocks out of there. So it doesn't take very long. So that's just spinning up. And all we're doing is, if we look at my object storage buckets, if I can get my scroll to work. Come on. Maybe not. Yep, there we are. We can see that I have one here. And basically, what we've done is not that one. Oh, live demos. There we are. Good old Wi-Fi. We break it down into different areas. So if we go into the backup, what we actually have is different blocks of data. And then we just go through. And remember Rick was saying about the metadata and the data blocks? This is how we store it. So we actually have a folder called metadata where we keep all the different checkpoints and data in there. And then we have one for the, the block store as well. So if we go over here, we can see that we're, we're running this. We can see that the file, now what we've told is the work of VMs OK, so it took, what, 57 seconds to spin that up and get it ready. And it says that our file level recovery browser is ready. So if I go back to protected data, and I go over here, we have this little thing called FLR. And I click on that. What it does is it gives us a unique URL 
to that particular worker. We click on that, and of course I haven't defined any real certificate, so. And then what it will do is we actually have the ability to now browse the volumes that have been backed up in that instance. So we can go through and we can go to users, we can pick the administrator account, we can go through and we can just go to documents, desktop, whatever we want to do. And we can see that this is pretty obvious where I deployed it from. And we can actually just so simply just say, right, okay, this file, click on that, I want to download it. And that will literally just down, do a normal web download from that browser. Or we can add it to a recovery list and we can download multiple items as well. So when we try to do those individual file restores, we've brought that granular level of control to EC2 as well. And as we progress through when we offer support for RDS as well, we'll bring a lot of those granular capabilities to this. So from a, a, a kind of Veeam perspective, this for those who haven't been Veeam customers before, this is kind of the Veeam goodness that we always bring, this simplicity of just being able to recover things very quickly and very easily. And if we go back, all I need to do now is, once I've downloaded that, I can just go and say, right, I'm done. I'll stop that. And then all we'll do is we'll process that and we'll go and shut down that particular worker node. So we spin them up as pretty small instances. We can see like it's a T2 medium. And eventually, that'll just disappear and we'll terminate that. So f we can see it's shutting down already. So from a compute cost perspective, there's not a huge amount of impact on our bills because we're running small instances. The cost of that is outweighed against copying lots of data across different regions as well. So it's very minimal from a cost perspective. So with that, what I want to show now is Ah, it locked out again. I love Windows. What was it Andy Jassy was saying about ever-increasing Windows costs? So what we see here is this is Veeam backup and replication. Everyone, most people are familiar with this. We have some backups, everything. On our backup infrastructure, we have this thing that I mentioned called an external repository. And we just add our S3 buckets in there where we're actually storing our backups using our, the S3 bucket as a backup repository for Veeam Backup for AWS. And we can see here, Oregon, for example, is using 46 gig, and this one's using 7 gig. Now, if we go back up here and I go to external repository, what we see is all the policies that are defined listed here. So these are the names of our policies. So I know that my instances are all under these different policies. So for example, I've got the bronze one, and there's the Windows instance that I've just been doing some file level recoveries from. And then what I can do is I can actually right click on that. I can restore back to EC2 from here if I wanted to. I can restore to this funny thing, I don't recognize the name. And then I can restore the guest files as well here locally on-prem if I wanted to. And then what I can do is I can actually pull those backups down and then go do something like a direct restore to vSphere or to Hyper-V or whatever you, you want to do on-prem. So it brings that whole kind of hybrid cloud that everybody seems to be really struggling with at the moment into, in, into the forefront of the technology. So by leveraging Veeam Backup for AWS to back up those instances, and then Veeam Backup and Replication. And what's really cool is, so all these on-prem backups I have, maybe I'm having a problem with my data center and I want to go and restore a particular VM into EC2. I can right click on that and I can actually go and just do, as you saw, a direct restore to EC2. So I can take this particular backup here, I can do a restore to EC2, and based on that tag definition, or how I've set my policies up, by restoring that into EC2, it will automatically get backed up 
by being back up for AWS as well. So we can automate a lot of that through scripts as well. So if you want to kind of do a lot of a scripting around this and automating your disaster recovery and failovers from on-prem out to EC2, and then include these automatically with those tags, as I mentioned, we can build out a true automated backup solution regardless of what platform you're running on, whether it's on-prem, on virtualization, or out in the public cloud. So that's kind of it for, for the demo. Now what I kind of want to finally touch on is, let's, let me skip that. I did have a, a, a recorded one just in case. I want to look at, for the last five minutes, disaster recovery to AWS. Disaster recovery has always been a bit of a challenge purely around its costs and how you can leverage AWS just to provide those recovery failover options out in the public cloud. Now, when we look at this, some of the key use cases are around test and dev, pretty obvious one. You know, you, a lot of people now don't spend a lot of money on dev environments to sit in the corner of their data centers. They just go to, to Amazon, stick their Amex card in, and, and, and do their dev test in there. But also migration to the cloud as well. How many people have actually migrated virtual machines or physical machines from on-prem out to Amazon? How many people enjoyed it? You, you're a masochist, aren't you? <laughs> well, apart from these two, the rest of you, we can make your life really easy. So they, they clearly like late nights and lots of coffee. But basically, we can take any backup of any virtual machine, anything that we support on-prem, so those Windows agents that people still use and Linux agents, after I spent eight years at VMware, I didn't realize anybody still lived in a physical world, but it turns out they do. We can take that VBK and just go and restore it to any region in EC2. So literally any backup from any hypervisor, any physical server, anything, we can go and recover that into EC2 just literally by leveraging that direct restore to AWS that I showed you. So what we do is we take backups of all those VMs or whatever we're doing on-prem. We can even store them on-prem. You don't need to actually use S3, have any of the scale-out backup repositories configured or anything. When you right-click and say direct restore to AWS, you can actually, what it does is it takes that VBK and it uploads that VBK into an S3 bucket. So from an EC2 perspective, once it's up in the S3 bucket, we actually do an API call to import that into EC2. So when you think about like BIOS conversion, stuff like that, you know, vSphere for a start is using, is using different BIOS and hyper, hypervisors to what Amazon's using. Conversions can be quite complicated. We, we make that process very, very simple. From a scripted perspective, we use um, Veeam Availability Orchestrator. We can actually script all this. So if you detect a, a failure in your data center of maybe a, a vSphere cluster or something like that, we can actually automate the actual automatic restores. Now, this, this is all dependent upon what your RPOs are and your RTOs but we can actually automate the failover of all it, the VMs running on your vSphere cluster into EC2, leveraging the direct restore to AWS. Now we go into a bit more detail, like we'll already have backups stored in S3, as we mentioned with the scale out backup repository, but we can fully automate that disaster recovery process. So with that, I did actually have a demo, but it's going to take longer than I've got left to show you. But what I'll do is I'll show you pretty quickly um, if Rick's gone. See, Rick loves embedded videos. He was meant to do this bit, but he hung me out high and dry to go do the cube. So restore to EC2. You just right click on it and you say, right, pick an AWS account. So you've already got your credentials in there. We pick the region and what data center we want. So we'll pick Ohio, because it's close to Rick. We then just have that particular name. We can go 
rename it if we want, add prefixes, suffixes, whatever we want to do. So for, for this instance, we'll just add that we've restored it. We can, again, assign tags to it, as I mentioned. So we can add, a, say, like Veeam backup, value true for this, whatever we're going to add to this. And when we have those tags appear on those instances, then Veeam backup for AWS will actually pick that up and just automatically add it to the policy. We can change the instance types again. So we'll edit this. We'll pick an instance type. Now, we automatically always refresh the instance types. And the reason for that is because Amazon occasionally do change them. So we always want to be current. So we'll pull down the instance types that Amazon list, and we'll pick a nice little small one because it's nice and cheap. And we're going to pick bring our own license. So from that perspective, we actually lower the costs as well because we're going to take our own licenses to Amazon depending on what we bought. We can pick all our different storage types out in EC2. We get an estimated price per month as well, per gigabyte. So we give you a little bit of granular cost control there. And then we go through and we pick the VPC. So it's very similar to what you saw. What, what we do very well, in my opinion, at Veeam is build out user interfaces that are very similar. So there's no kind of, doesn't matter whether you're trying to do a restore to Hyper-V, to EC2, to vSphere, whatever, we can just pick these. Now we can use appliances, proxy appliances, so we can actually spin up proxies to speed this up. So again, we use the terminology workers in EC2 and on-prem, we use the terminology of a proxy. And then we just go through and we say, next. And then in a sec, we'll finish it. So now we'll see that we're just going to do a restore. So that will actually start to spin up a worker node in EC2. It will copy the data up to that proxy. And we'll import that into S3 and do a direct import into EC2 as well. So it's really simple, really quick. As I mentioned, we can script all this through our orchestrator tool set. So when we're actually doing that, what's really cool is it's fully automated. And we can see here that we have the proxy appliance has already been terminated, and now we have that EC2 instance. Was that easier than what you guys did? Yeah? I told you. See, I can even solve your problems. So. It's really straightforward. We, as I mentioned, any backup of anything that we support on-prem, vSphere, Hyper-V, Windows, Linux, whatever, we can restore directly into EC2 pretty quickly. So it, it's really straightforward, really easy, and we solve a lot of the headaches. So I expect to see some emails from you guys later saying, how do we get this? <laughs> ah. You'll do it again one day, I'm sure. So with that, we've got about a minute and 30 seconds left. I did actually get through the demo. What I would say is come down the booth. We have a really cool magician who does some really funny tricks with nails in his heads and stuff. Um, come see us. We've got competitions. We always have free socks and t-shirts and all sorts of stuff. But come along. If you've got any more questions on the demos or anything, we've got a load of guys down there and a load of girls who can, who can talk about that. So thank you from me, thank you from Rick, thank you very much. <laughs>